welcome back everyone and I appreciate you stopping by on today's video. We are diving into the world of fast action ships that seem to have come really to an end of their journey of a roller coaster ride including procurement woes, money spending nightmares and reliability hell. Yes, we are talking about the littoral combat ships. But before we learn about the fascinating world of this combat ship, let's talk a little bit today about our video sponsor World of Warships. World of Warships is a free-to-play game available on both PC and console where you can command a massive naval fleet featuring some of the most historic and iconic war vessels out there, including unlocking new ships as you prepare to dominate the seas. I actually really enjoy playing this game with my friends when I want to take on a host of naval firepower in some really good PvP battles on the ocean waves. This game features new content released every month including recently some major updates such as Godzilla vs Kong, Transformers, Popeye, Megadeth and Azure Lane collaborations. Whether it's new ships, in-game nations, cosmetics or even the ship classes you can always count on enjoying fresh and exciting gameplay experiences all over the World of Warships genre. The game has more than 40 unique maps with dynamic weather, all of which have been updated with stunning new water effects and textures that make the game seas virtually beautiful as you sail around launching volleys of high explosive shells or torpedoes under the depths. The host of ships is impressive as well, giving the ability to conquer the oceans aboard history's most iconic battleships, destroyers, aircraft carriers, cruisers and submarines. Oh and I did mention that it is available on both PC and console cross-platform and if you're wanting to join many who are playing right now, make sure you click on the link in the description box below and use the promo code BRAVO when registering to receive a huge starter pack including 500 doubloons, 1.5 million credits and a 7 day premium account time including a ship. So what are you waiting for? Go click on the link below and join many other players who are battling out on the seas right now in World of Warships. So let's get back to talking about the little crappy ship, otherwise known as the littoral combat ship. And its evolving identity has really changed quite a significant amount over the 22 year history that it's had, but recent developments have really firmly established it as a substantial financial burden, and unfortunately we're saying goodbye to the littoral series, and it's quite a sad story overall, one of which I've always wanted to see succeed, but it just hasn't. The US Navy is in the process of decommissioning 9 out of the 35 littoral combat ships in addition to the five already taken out of service. This includes vessels like the recently retired LCS Sioux City, which has been in operation for less than five years. Early decommissioning of these ships comes at a considerable cost, amounting to nearly seven billion US dollars as per analysis by Defense News recently, utilizing data from the Congressional Budget Office. However, experts emphasize that the real cost goes beyond the financial figures as the Pentagon readies itself again for the possibility of a conflict with China, a nation that has spent the last two decades fortifying its anti-access and aerial defenses to protect its shores, and the opportunity cost is even more significant. The LCS, which was meant to be a versatile asset, finds itself sidelined in an era of evolving threats and shifting strategic priorities, particularly in the Asia Pacific, which is quite significant folks. When we talk about cost, it's not always the cost of uh, money, it's the cost of time, development and strategic capability. When you take an entire fleet potentially out of its commission and the time it took to get that fleet up and running, you're taking a huge asset out of what would have been the US Navy's primary defensive or offensive capability in that region and it's quite scary actually to know that that is a pretty big downfall they now have uh, taking this as a somewhat of a blunder in that region. But let's talk a little bit about the introduction. How did this ship come to be? Well the United States Navy's littoral combat ship was conceived as a game-changing innovation in naval warfare designed to operate in shallow waters and close to shorelines fulfilling a variety of naval mission profiles. Now it was actually sort of benchmarked from the Danish Navy uh, when they looked at capabilities of ships being modular. You could actually change a ship in the way in which it operates with a smaller crew, therefore more flexible in shallower waters and shoreline waters. However, it didn't quite work out for the United States that way. Over time, this once promising program encountered numerous challenges resulting in its eventual failure. 
Now, the ambitious design and concept was really, really high profile. I mean, we're talking about a wish list that I don't think Santa could even provide. The LCS program took shape in the early 2000s with a lofty goal of developing a family of very versatile, extremely fast and modular warships that could adapt to the evolving demands of the modern naval warfare of today. The program envisioned two distinct variants, the Freedom Class, built by Lockheed Martin, and the Independence Class, constructed by Ostel USA. Now, the ships in their look are actually quite different. You see the sort of standard, almost frigate-like ship, and then one that has sort of hydroplane, weird-looking channels down the side, which is where my mind always goes when I think of the LCS platform, but they are actually two different classes. Right from the outset, the LCS program faced staggering cost overruns and persistent delays with both manufacturers. Originally budgeted at around $220 million per ship, the final cost soared to an incredible $500 million US dollars per vessel, creating a severe financial strain for the Navy and, of course, the US government. These cost overruns were primarily attributed to frequent design changes, increased complexity, and the shipbuilding industry unable to adhere to the initially projected budget. When you're creating a new ship of this kind, it is totally out of the norm and something which the US Navy isn't really used to capitalizing on with the industry at the time. The Danish military, of course a smaller navy, has zeroed in on the way in which their modular ships are made, so it was a lot easier for them to produce with their industry. The US Navy, not so much. They're designing huge, massive aircraft carriers, big frigates um, and big destroyers, not something that the US Navy and the industry supplying the US Navy is used to. Some of the biggest shortfalls were its mission modules. A crucial selling point for the LCS was its mission module system designed to enable rapid reconfiguration for various mission profiles, including anti-submarine warfare, mine countermeasures, or surface warfare. However, this modular system encountered severe developmental challenges. It's not easy trying to make a ship be like a Lego piece. It just doesn't. Everything needs to connect. There's a lot of different variations of computer systems, technology that need to link. And when you try and change them out, especially with a seaworthy vessel, it's very, very difficult. The mission modules faced huge technical issues, causing significant delays and rendering the LCS less versatile than originally envisioned, and in fact, to the point of which the legacy fleet was taking some of the responsibilities of which these ships were supposed to do. The LCS was criticized significantly also with its survivability and even its armament. It was quite vulnerable in high-intensity combat scenarios. Its limited armor and armament were perceived as inadequate for confronting advanced adversaries. In fact, some comments were made in Congress about potentially looking at these ships as, well, why don't you care about our sailors? Do we not actually want to protect them? Speed in a ship is something that's obviously pretty critical, but if you don't have the armament or the capabilities to defend it, it doesn't make much sense sending out to sea in a combat environment, and that is exactly what the US Navy was being pressured very heavily on from the defense sector and, of course, the US government. The issues raised substantial concerns about the ship's ability with, to really withstand threats from, of course, China, and anti-ship missiles are one of the big ones. There was also the sophisticated weapon systems that China were trying to develop, including Russia, with hypersonic missiles that could take out ships from long distance with absolutely no protection from Aegis carrier groups, um, which have, you know, uh, the aircraft carriers, the Aegis, uh, you know, missile defense platform. These ships aren't really going to have them because they're working independently. So it was really undermining its effectiveness in a contested littoral environment. There was also engineering problems and really, really bad mechanical failures. Throughout its deployment, the LCS program grappled with an array of engineering problems and mechanical failures. These issues range from propulsion system breakdowns, uh, basic equipment malfunctions, and even potentially hull integrity concerns. The high frequency of these breakdowns and failures significantly compromised the operational readiness and effectiveness of the LCS fleet, and of course, people were watching. There was a large investment into these ships, and when things failed, it wasn't just a blip in the water, it was a wave, literally. And the US government was noticing this, the defense sector was noticing this, and of course the taxpayer was noting this. We're seeing ships coming back to port, being repaired consistently on its sea trials, and just not going well. Of course, there's also a big change in naval strategy. As geopolitical realities evolved, the United States Navy reorientated its strategic focus, emphasizing great power competition, particularly with China and Russia in this kind of strategy. The LCS, initially designed for littoral operations against asymmetric threats, struggled to really adapt to this new strategic landscape, where more versatile and heavily armed vessels were needed. There was also an overcrowding fleet and the budgetary constraints with that. As its zenith, the LCS program expanded to encompass over 30 ships, and that is a lot of ships, a substantial number for a program plagued by problems. 
Maintaining this fleet, along with the prospect of retrofitting them to meet revised requirements upcoming, imposed a significant financial burden on the Navy's budget and resources. Faced with this array of problems, the US Navy finally opted to decommission a portion of the LCS fleet. The decision was made with the intent to ease the operational burden, reduce the maintenance costs, and reallocate resources to more capable and adaptable ship classes. In conclusion, the United States Navy's littoral combat ship, or little crappy ship, was kind of born from ambitious goals and innovative concepts, but ultimately succumbed to a multitude of challenges. It was almost born into a family that hated it, and it was kind of sad to see that because it had so much potential. With the cost overrun delays, mission module issues, survivability concerns, engineering problems, different strategic priorities all played in the program's failure. As the Navy adapts to confront emerging threats, the decommissioning of the LCS program serves as a pretty stark reminder, though, that the importance of flexibility and responsiveness in maintaining a modern naval fleet, it's great making it, but if you can't maintain it and allow you to actually uh, financially support this more modernized fleet, it's near impossible to allow it to succeed. The lessons learned from the LCS program's shortcomings will really undoubtedly shape the future decisions ensuring that the US Navy remains a formidable force in the rapidly changing global security landscape which as we know right now is significant. The Asia Pacific scenario is pretty tense um, and in this era of evolving threats the US Navy really continues to evolve its strategy to meet those challenges of a very complex and dynamic world and unfortunately the LCS did not quite fit into that world that they really saw. I hope you learned a little bit about why this ship needed to be sent to the scrapyard. Hopefully we'll see if some of them maybe stay around in the future, who knows. Uh, but I really do appreciate you staying around for today. Let me know what you think of this ship. Do you think it was doomed from the start? Or do you think there's still some you know, realm or facet of uh, potential for this ship of the future? Let me know in the comment section below. I'd love to hear your opinion in your comments. And thank you again for joining me. Feel free to check out that link in the description box below for World of Warships and have a great day.